All right, so I've refined this shape out of an existing one that Laura already carved, but I haven't made a hold from scratch. So I'm gonna take one of these square blocks over here and start to form a hold from the very beginning so you can get a sense of what that process looks like. And I'm gonna make a couple smaller crimps because I want more of those on my wall. And there's some things you should pay attention to when sculpting some thinner, smaller holds. So we'll get into that as I shape those. You first kind of want to define the shape you want to carve out of it. This one's gonna be a little bit more freehand and the kind of details and those abstract lines of the hold might define a little bit more of its shape in the end. So I'm gonna kind of leave it a little bit looser, but you still wanna kind of define the volume um, that the hold will occupy. And you can use a permanent marker or any marking surface to start to kind of define the shape and size. So I want these crimps to be fairly small volume will carry all the way across it. Um, I always think it's better to keep your hold kind of thicker with more material rather than cut too much off because you can never add it back on afterwards. It's also important to keep kind of one flat side that you want to keep as the back of your hold. That way you have a surface that's kind of completely level. Um, so I'm going to keep this side kind of untouched and I'm going to carve from this side where I've marked it. Now I'm going to do something actually right now. Um, I'm not going to use this technique for this hold. But one thing you can do is create kind of a relief cut and then you can actually snap this foam and you get kind of like a organic kind of texture that's somewhat true to a lot of climbing holds you might see outside. So it gets that kind of natural rock texture and you can kind of use that as a base to shape from if that gives you guys any ideas. Um, I'm not going to use that here obviously, but figured I'd just show it. So I want to make this hold pretty minimal, but I want to make sure there's enough material between the wall and the bolt head so that the hold has some structural integrity. And one way to do that, um, to keep your hold thick, but then also make your crimp very narrow, is to kind of create a profile that has almost like a, a blocker built into it. So you kind of have a smoother, kind of unusable angle here, and then it comes out into your actual kind of crimp. I think that's what I'm gonna do here, is I'm gonna make a shape something like this. So there's a lot of surface material to have some friction against the wall, and also enough material that the bolt will pass through, creates less of a surface for me to actually crimp on. And I'm probably gonna make it smaller than that, but you can see right now that's about a pad width. I'm gonna make it even narrower, I think, but it would be pretty hard to grab up here. I'm gonna use that as my profile. And then for here, I'm gonna, again, kind of make it more organic in shape. So I'll just carve to an aesthetic I like. As long as this profile kind of lives throughout it, it'll work for my purposes. All right, so not very pretty, but you can see I've kind of just removed enough material that I have this kind of base structure to start with. And I can kind of start removing and removing more material. You can also make holds smaller depending on how they're shaped actually in the process when you pour them. If you only pour so much resin into this, well that back portion, this is gonna get thinner and thinner and thinner, and obviously that's gonna change the shape and the usable area of your hold. But I think it's always nice to have more shape than less, especially for your home wall, because then you can actually kind of pour shapes of different sizes using the same mold but we'll keep kind of refining this. I want to make this obviously thinner and thinner because I want this to be kind of crimpy. Um, I want to remove more of the, this pinch right now. You can pinch it. I'm going to remove more material from the backside and round it out more and again, make it a lot narrower. All right, so now that I have this kind of shape, I'm gonna to start to do something similar to what I did last time, which is create these kind of larger cracks or wave features and let that dictate how the aesthetic kind of wraps around this hole. All right, so I'm starting to get a place where I'm happy with it. Um, you can 
start to maybe see that the profile of it, although this is a very thick hold, that the usable space is actually kind of this little in cut here, which is, depending on how you grab it, probably just over half a pad, which is kind of about what I'm looking for. The front of the face isn't that useful. This back half isn't useful either. It's a good idea to have one kind of directional light source here so you can really see the shadows and all the little nicks and, and potential problems, which I'm starting to see in this. If you have one kind of diffused soft light, you're not gonna see those details. Because I actually have two different colored lights on the right and left of me, I actually have these blue and orange kind of shadows. So I can actually see a lot of those shadows and imperfections without needing a single directional light source. And this is kind of very familiar to 3D space when you drop lights on a scene. So you can kind of see the topology of your mesh. So I'm gonna keep going at this for a bit longer and then we'll get to the mold making process. Speaking of the mold making process, and as mentioned elsewhere, don't forget to look in the description for a one-time discount code for those materials and links to where you can order them, as well as other tools I use. Thanks again. All right, so here you can see all three shapes. They turned out pretty close to how I wanted. The one on the far right, which is one of the newer shapes, is a little bit more organic and a little bit more intricate than the original hold which I made over here and the latest hold right here is kind of somewhere in the middle so I have this gradient of kind of aesthetics but they all feel part of the same family so I have a drill press just out of screen that I'm actually going to use to drill the holes because they're going to be perfectly perpendicular to the back of the hold and thus the climbing wall um, and it means minimal cleanup after I actually cast the holds but I will show you how you can do it without a drill press because that's definitely not necessary and a little bit overkill. All right, so these holds need a set screw. Um, maybe the smaller one, not so much, but just to be safe, it's not a bad idea. And this kind of jugier hold definitely needs one because of the size of the climbing surface and you could definitely wrench on it from one side and spin that hold. Same with the pinch, it's pretty big. And if I drill the bolt hole directly center here, it leaves a lot of room for kind of leverage. So um, I've already kind of designed these holds in a way where a set screw should be easily fit into the design. So the set screw is right here. So you can actually just drop your bit, hold it as straight as you can, and just start spinning it. And this is kind of the same process you would use to drill in your bolt hole. So there we go. We have a set screw hole already in that one. And one of the reasons why I'm using a drill press for the bolt hole but not for the set screw hole is that it's less important for the set screw to be perfectly perpendicular to the wall it's just there to stop the hold from spinning however it should probably be as straight as possible because if you screw a set screw in on an angle into your wall it's going to start to chew up your plywood and your holes in the plywood are going to become more and more noticeable something to think about um, you can also drill your um, set screw holes after you cast the holds, but it's more work, it's more material, and there's actually a way I cast both the bolt hole and the set screw holes that requires me to have these holes in the actual shapes originally. And so that's why I'm doing it this way. Um, I'll get to that later and you'll kind of see what I'm talking about when I actually make the molds as well as when I actually cast the holds. So I use the countersink bit and just countersink these. I'm gonna use this drill press over here, so I'm gonna reset up my camera so you can see what that looks like. Um, but I am gonna manually create the countersink for the uh, actual bolt head after and not use the drill press for that. Um, and I'll explain why and I'll show that too. Um, and that'll give you an idea again of how you can use a drill bit to create it, or even actually the bolt itself to create that hole.
All right, so now that I have the bolt holes drilled, I need to make the countersink for the head of the bolt. And you could do that with another bit, which would be totally fine, but I like to actually use the bolt itself. I can just drop it into the hole and then I can just twist it using the hole as a guide. And kind of just mark where it should sit. And you can kind of see that there's a ring now where the edge of the bolt is. And we do that with all of them. And because the bolt also has these like ribs on the side of it, it actually helps to kind of cut it in as well. And then I can kind of turn the bolt upside down, and kind of cut in the marks. All right, so you want it to be inset enough that the bolt head doesn't stick out too far, but you also don't want to inset too far where this starts to become like a mono or a thumb catch for the climber to stick their thumb in. You want to widen it out a bit so that there's some play with where the bolt head sits and it also gives a good enough shelf for when you put the washer in the hold when you cast it and we'll get to that later. There's always some growing and shrinking of the shape so you need to always give a little bit of wiggle room for that expansion and contraction. And that's about perfect. That's just about where I want it. Has a bit of breathing room, a little bit of, of give, but it kind of slots in there nicely. But I am going to just use my finger here. Again, the texture isn't as important. So if I flatten some of the texture, it's not gonna affect the way it climbs, but this will just make any sharp edge just a little bit softer. Give it a teeny little bit of a bevel. There is that kind of crimpy hold, completely finished. You can see how it's got a lot of depth and a lot of material to keep it really strong and stable, but the usable part of the hold is literally only about half of my first pad. So you're not gonna be able to hold onto that and you're not really gonna be able to hold on to any of this. It's just this part. I have a nice little in-cut edge just to make it a little, little friendlier for holding onto if you swing out, but you know, it's not a super deep jug or anything like that. Still pretty crappy. All right, so I apologize for this mask still on my face. Hopefully you can hear me, but there's still a ton of dust in the air and I think it's a good idea to keep it on. So it's gonna stay for now, but I have those shapes in a place where I'm happy with them and we can call them done. And the next step is going to be actually making molds so we can pour the holds. And I'm gonna save that for another video where I'm gonna talk about this thing and why you might consider making one if you're going to pour some climbing holds so we'll get to that in the next video and we'll see you in that one <laughs>